on, let's go. It already started. I don't want to go. But Todd thinks you're coming. You want to let him down? I never told Todd I was going. <sighs> Come on, Matt. He needs our support. So you're putting your faith in something you've never even seen. But it's not a blind faith. We can prove that God exists. Well, where? I don't see any proof. I mean, where is he? God's a spirit. You can't see him. Oh, he's probably just hiding. I mean, come on, God. Come out and show yourself like a man. <laughs> come on, be serious. God's invisible. Well, how do you know God even exists if he's invisible? We just know, believe me. Why should we take your opinion? We have evidence. <laughs> what evidence? That God's invisible? Just because you can't see God, it doesn't mean he's not there. Todd, do you see my girlfriend standing here in front of me? You don't see her? Oh, hey, just because you don't see her doesn't mean she doesn't exist. <laughs> Give me a break. You guys are just playing with words. No, we just want you to realize what it is you're saying. You don't want to face the fact that there is a God and you're going to have to deal with him. And you don't want to answer my question. How do you prove God exists if you can't even see him? I... Come on, we're waiting. You can't see the motion of the mom, but you know it exists. You can't see the wind, but you know it exists. Come on, Todd. I just know he's there. No, it seems to me that you're the one with the blind faith. There has to be a God. Just look at all the people who believe in him around the world. Yeah, I can show you a lot of kids that believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> that doesn't mean he exists. You guys don't want to believe. We don't need some religious crutch to lean on. It's not a religious crutch. You still haven't answered my question. How do you prove God exists if you can't even see him? I don't know. Those philosophy club guys, they think they're so brilliant. God's only been a Christian for a short time. He wasn't prepared to debate with them. Oh, yeah, well, we had somebody else in mind, but uh, he wasn't available. What's that supposed to mean? Uh, it means we wanted you to do it. Look, I'm not going to present truth to people whose only intention is to rip it apart. Yeah. Too busy reading another commentary? At least I read them. Uh, guys, please. Huh? All right, I'm sorry, man. I'm just irritated. It's fine. Hey, where'd Todd go? I don't know. He just drove off in his car. We'll talk to him. I just hate letting those guys think they got the best of us. I mean, I wish we could come up with something that would just put them in their place. <laughs> you know, you could tell them, you know, when the world's gonna end, that'd get their attention. Huh? Jess. Wait, wait, what's this? Well, it's this uh, report that Matt's been studying. It supposedly tells us when the world's gonna end. For real? Will you forget yeah. about it? Wait, 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 that's a great idea. What, what's this all about? Well, it's about this uh, paper that the student wrote. It's um, about nothing, right, Jess? Would you wait a minute? I want to know. No, it's about nothing. Come on, tell me. Forget about it. Tell the boy, man. Forget about what, it. What is your deal? Take care, Scott. I'll talk to you later, Jess. Matt! Something's bothering him. Hey, what's with this end of the world thing? Well, I mean, it's this report that Matt's been studying. He found it in the library. It's written by this student, uh, Jeffrey Bartell, like 50 years ago. It's a theory he had or got from someone. I'm not sure which, but anyway, he tries to show us that the Bible tells us when the world's going to end. You read it? No, no, not yet. Matt was telling me some things. It sounds pretty interesting. You know, you can get it in the library. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Anyway, okay. See you later. Yeah, I'll see you. Look, Todd, you did fine. Don't worry about it. You didn't blow it. Listen, I don't want to hear any more about Derek and those jerks. Who cares what they had to say? The point is that people heard what you had to say and they listened. Listen, I got a plan. What time does the library close? Don't worry about it. I got a plan. Just hang in there and we'll talk later, all right? We'll talk later. Just relax.
thirty percent all the college kids. A lot of them do. Hi, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't mean to interrupt or anything, but um, is this the philosophy club headquarters where all the atheists hang out? Who are you? An interested party. So when is your next meeting? It's a week from Thursday. Why? Do you have a topic yet? Actually, we were just discussing it. I have a topic for you. Yeah, what's that? The end of the world. What about it? I think I know when it's going to end. You do? I mean, at least when the Bible says it will. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, what's wrong? Too deep of a topic for you boys? No. Is this a joke? Do I look like I'm joking? Well, are you? Here's some information for your posters. When the world will end. A presentation by uh, Scott Lawrence. What, what is this, you? Uh, yeah. You're gonna make this presentation? He catches on fast. So are you gonna do it or not? Okay, you're on. We'll start posting it tomorrow. Good, I'll see you at the meeting. Oh, Scott, we don't want another clown like that last guy. Just make sure you two guys show up. <laughs> you did what? A week from Thursday, 8 o'clock. Are you nuts? Those guys don't want to hear about that stuff. What do you mean? That paper is great. It's one man's opinion. I was just jealous I thought of it first. Yes, that's what I am, jealous. Look, just because you want to sit around and do nothing doesn't mean that I have to. Uh, Scott, look, Matt's right. You can't just walk in there Look, and... we gotta do something. That paper's loaded and Matt knows it. Those guys don't want to hear about the paper. Why not? It's too controversial for one thing. No! That paper's gonna put those guys in their place. Look, I, I gotta get out of here. I got a lot of studying to do. Well, well hold on. Scott, would you just listen Scott. for a moment? Scott! I just saw the posters, guys. Hey, what's up, Frank? <laughs> Man, what are y'all up to now? That's for real. Some kid says he thinks he knows when the world's gonna end. <laughs> Who's the dude? I don't know, some religious wacko. Came to the office yesterday. <laughs> hey, <laughs> this is a joke, right? No, it's no joke. Come on. Now, this kid was dead serious. <laughs> you think the boy's got anything? Yeah, guts. You're gonna check him out, right? Yeah, what for? Kid's a fake. <laughs> yeah, but you should at least still check up on him. No, we won't need to on this one. No, come on now. It's like I say, you never know when you need any ammo. No, kid's an amateur. We'll shoot him down in two minutes. Kid was an idiot. All right. I hear you. Scott, can I talk to you for a minute? Look, I know what you're going to say, so save your breath. <sighs> Scott, we've always been friends, right? You don't think I can do this, do you? It's not that. Those guys are just going to want to tear you apart in there. No. You don't think I can handle this. No. The subject matter is not the best. The subject matter. The end of the world is a great subject. That's not my point. Look, I need to do this. Why? Why do you want to do this so badly? I won't let anybody walk all over Todd. This isn't about Todd. This is about you. Look, you don't need to help me. I'll do it by myself. What are you trying to prove, Scott? Just close the door on the way out. I got work to do. All right. Good luck. You gotta help me talk Scott out of this meeting. He won't listen. We at least try. You know how he is when he starts into something. I know, he's great at starting things. It's just finishing them that's the problem. Maybe it'll be good for him. Don't you think he's in over his head? Might do better than you think. I'm worried about it. Have some faith, buddy. You might just pull it off. Go. Will you just talk to him?
You know that Derek Hinman and Greg guy who's always with? Yeah, I know those guys. I'm gonna make them regret embarrassing Todd the way they did. I heard Derek's parents are pretty rich. Figures. I'm telling you, that paper that Matt has in the library, it's just, it's great. It's filled with so much information, they're not even gonna know what hit them. Someone's gonna have to put those intellectuals back a grade. I guess it's gonna have to be me. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you, Derek. I didn't know you had company. What's up, Frank? Yeah, Derek, can I talk to you out here for a minute? Yeah. What's up? Yeah, Derek, that kid that's supposed to make that presentation at the next meeting, is he uh, about your height with dark hair? Yeah, that's about right. I just saw him in the game room with one of his buddies. He was talking about you and Greg. He was bragging about how he had some type of information that was going to put you two guys in your place next week. Look, he's talking a pretty big game. Really? I'm telling you, Derek, you need to check this guy out, man. You might be taking him too light. Yeah, you're right, you're right. I'm gonna get Greg on it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right, check you later. Yeah. copy to you by tomorrow. Okay. Oh, I need you to put it in the bold print for me. Yeah. Oh, put the box around it, just like you did last time. Good. Yeah, all right, thanks. Bye-bye. Well, anything good on our boy? What usually happens when you go digging? You come up with dirt. DWI this year. Oh, Greg, that's good. See, he used to be in the Deltas. What, the party fraternity? Yeah, but he quit it two and a half years ago when he got religious. And so he got the DWI after he got religious. Oh, that's perfect. And my list is now up to nine girls I know he's dated this year. Scotty boy gets around, does he? Not all the church types either. One of them, Sandra Bennett. Wait, Bennett? The campus prostitute? Oh, I'm sorry, is there another? This kid's making all the rounds. I'll have a few more names before the meeting. Oh, this is good. This is good stuff. We gotta use this. I think Church Boy's gonna wish he never stepped into this office. <laughs> the hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Matt. How are you? Hey, Sally. Hey, guys. Hey, what's hey, up, Barry? You going to the fellowship tonight? Ah, uh, yeah, probably. Hey, I see your pal Scott's gonna take on those philosophy club guys. Hope he blows them away. Be quite a night. Four way traffic, right? I get a blowout. Everybody talking at me, right? Man, I, what am I supposed to do? I stop the car, right? Get out. Right? Is it Scott? Hey, Scott. Good to see you again. Hey, it's the atheists. Hey, I want you to know we're looking forward to the meeting. Yeah, you might be now. But you're not going to run over me like you did with Todd. Oh, Scott. You know when we talked the other day? You looked so familiar to me, but I couldn't place it. But you used to be with the Delta fraternity, right? Yeah. So what? It's a big party group. That was before I became a Christian. Oh, so I guess you don't drink anymore. That's right, I don't. Oh, what's wrong? Against the faith? Are you guys done? Yeah. Just wanted to check in with you. Well, like I said, just make sure you show up at the meeting. Okay, before the time the concert is at six. We gotta go five o'clock or five o'clock. Why? 
food. We're gonna get some food. I want to get some food. I'll tell you what. Let's leave about five thirty on Saturday for the concert. Hey, don't forget, Scott's got his big presentation on Thursday at the Philosophy Club. Eight o'clock p.m. Oh man, he's a big camp celebrity now. You better watch out. Those guys can be pretty tough. I'm not worried. Hey, I got inside information that the rapture is gonna happen Thursday afternoon, so I'm planning on missing it anyway. Oh man. Hey, JD, tell him why I didn't show up. What are you talking about? What makes you so sure that I'm going to be here to tell hey, him? I'm just warning you. Hey, you know. I'm not, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be with you. You're not going with me. Hey, I'm taking a limo. A limo? You can't take a limo up there, man. Scott's loving this. See you later. Where are you going? We don't need a limo up there. I mean, the streets are gold, but, you know. I'm driving. Matt, wait up. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You sure? Yeah, I'm okay. okay. You know, I've been noticing, you've been riding Scott really hard lately. Sometimes I don't particularly care for Scott. Why? He looks up to you. Scott hasn't changed since he was in grade school. Come on, Matt, give Scott a break. I mean, the guy's trying to do something good here. Something good? He's going in there talking about a controversial subject that he knows nothing about. Well, he means well. You don't know him like I do. I mean, he's always getting involved in situations, and I'm always the one who has to bail him out. He doesn't think. I just think his attitude is wrong in what he's doing. Yeah, maybe so, but it seems to me that your attitude hasn't been the best lately either. Yeah, I know. So what's wrong? I guess I'm just a little burned out. Burned out? Yeah, it just seems like all I ever do is study the Bible. Well, what's wrong with that? I mean, you know the Bible better than anyone I know. Yeah, but knowing it and doing something with it are two different things. What do you mean? I mean, you teach a Sunday school class, you talk to a lot of people. I mean, is that all that's bothering you? I mean, ease up on yourself. I've been having some weird dreams lately. You know, I told you not to eat before you go to bed. <laughs> I guess I'm just a little stressed out. Yeah. Hey, I'm heading back inside. You coming? Nah, go ahead. I'll see you later. Hey, Scott. You got a minute? What do you guys want? We're still on for Thursday, right? Of course we're still on. Well, good. I just want to make sure our star pupil shows up. You know, we're promoting it pretty big. Yeah, well, don't worry. I'll be there. Okay, man. We'll see you Thursday. Okay, man. Oh, Scott. I was speaking to a good friend of yours the other day. You know Sandra Bennett, don't you? Yeah, I know her. Yeah. Thought you did. Oh, uh, she told me to tell you hi.
doing? What have you been up to? Well, I've just been busy. I saw the poster. Oh, yeah. Think you're a big shot now, huh? Well, you know. <laughs> Sounds like you're into something pretty deep. I just, uh, you know, I want to give these philosophy club guys something to think about. Hey, I got a call from one of their leaders yesterday. Uh, a Derek someone. Derek Hindman. He started asking me all these questions about you. Somehow he knew we dated. Huh. Anyway, he said it was all a big joke and told me not to tell you. I didn't tell him anything. What an idiot. I'd be careful with this guy. He seemed really weird. Uh, look, don't worry about it. He's, uh, he's harmless. You all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. It was good to see you, and good luck at your meeting. Thanks, Lori. Thanks for letting me know. Ladies, it's right through this door. Thank you for coming today. We sure have enjoyed having you here. Hey man, can I borrow a buck? I need a soda. You already owe me 20. So I owe you 21. Fine. I thought Scott was with you. No, he went back to his room to uh, do some more study. You know, he's really getting nervous. Well, this is gonna be embarrassing. But he's determined to do it. I'm gonna kill him. So what are you doing? Uh, just finishing up my Sunday school lesson. What class are you teaching? Junior hires. They're really into the Bible. Whoa, heavy stuff this week. The two gates, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Narrow is the way that leads to life, but few there be that find it. <laughs> that should definitely get their attention. You ever think about those verses? I mean, really think about them? Bottom line, when all is said and done, only a few people will get into the kingdom. And what am I doing about it? Nothing. Scott is. Or at least he's trying. I've been pretty hard on him, haven't I? Yeah. Hey, Scott. What do you want? What are you doing? I'm memorizing my verses. I don't want to go in there using notes. I know I've been pretty hard on you lately, and I'm sorry. Whatever. Are you sure you want to do this? Of course I'm sure. This is my chance. Chance for what? Payback. Scott, the idea here isn't to preach at these guys to get back at them. We're supposed to be trying to reach them, remember? Well, we aren't going to reach them sitting in our dorm room studying our Bible all night, are we? They're just going to mock you like they did with Todd. I can't just sit around and do nothing. So if you don't mind, I have work to do. All right, fine. Hope you don't get your head cut off. Fine! Pretty decent crowd for this thing after all. Might want to bring some more chairs. Well, that's great, man. We want more people standing. Put more pressure on them. Well, he's coming. Hey, Sky. What? Got a big night tonight. Expecting a good crowd. The more the merrier. Well, eight o'clock, right? Yeah, I know the time. Just reminding you. Don't be late. Oh, Greg, don't forget to pick up Jamie tonight at his apartment. Remember, he lost his license from that DWI. We need to get going. I'm staying here. Let's not go through this again. I'm not going. 
You know, he needs our support. He doesn't deserve it. Sometimes you can be a real jerk. Okay, so I'm a real jerk. Fine, I'll go without you. Scott, what are you doing here? You're on in ten minutes. You need to get over there. I, uh, I can't go through with it. What? I'm not ready. I was just over there. There's a bunch of people waiting to hear your presentation. I can't go. Scott, you've got to go. I can't. You can't leave these people hanging. I can't go. You've got to go. You don't know some of the things I've been doing. It's really bad. I'd be ashamed to tell you. You still have to go. You've got to go for me. What? You've got to go for me. I can't go. Look, you were right. I was wrong. My attitude was wrong. I've been feeling guilty all day. You still have to go. You gotta help me, Matt. I don't care. You gotta get over there. I can't! I gotta get myself right with the Lord. Scott, I... You gotta help me, Matt! Please. I can't do it. All right, I'll go. I'll go with you. Matt, I'm sorry. Me too. Excuse me. Excuse me, can I have your attention for a moment, please? My name is Matt Hewitt. I'm a friend of Scott's, the guy who was supposed to speak to you this evening. Due to some problems on Scott's end and a great misunderstanding, Scott will be unable to make the meeting tonight. I've come to apologize for Scott, and he's sorry for any inconvenience this may have caused. So what happened? He chickened out? Scott just wasn't ready to make the presentation. <laughs> you chickened out. <laughs> he sounded pretty confident when he confronted us in our office. Look, what happened was, I found this report in a library that this student named Jeffrey Bartell wrote about 50 years ago. Bartell did a thesis showing specific Bible verses that he felt told us when the world might end. Scott caught wind of this and thought it would be a great subject to debate here. Unfortunately, he realized he wasn't familiar enough with the material to talk about it tonight. Are you familiar with it? Excuse me? I said, are you familiar with it? Familiar with what? With the subject. Well, I studied it pretty extensively, and then I did my own study, but... Well, let's hear it then. No, you don't understand. I just came down here to give you a message from Scott. You're a Christian, aren't you? Yes. Aren't Christians always supposed to be ready to say what they believe? Yes, but... Well, say it then. Look, I'm sorry that this misunderstanding has happened, but I'm not wanting to discuss this issue. Typical Christian here. They make all these claims about heaven and hell and tell us we all need Jesus to save us, but that's about as far as it goes. Most of them don't know the first thing about their faith. Look, ma'am. No, you look. We came down here tonight to hear a discussion on when the world's going to end, not to waste our time. Your friend should have thought about that before he committed himself. Now, if you know the information, then let's hear it. That's what we came down here for. Yeah. Who's the killer? I don't know, but I love her. I don't want to discuss this issue. You guys don't even believe in God, let alone the Bible to be the Word of God. You'll never accept anything I say, so what's the point? All right. We'll give you both counts. There is a God, and the Bible is the Word of God. Now you shouldn't have any more excuses. So tell us, when's the world going to end? We'd like to know. First of all, no one knows the day and hour of Christ's return and when the world's going to end. The scriptures make that clear. That's what I thought. But the Bible says that we can know the times and seasons surrounding his coming. And the conditions are so ripe that these events could begin at any moment. 
So now you're going to tell us that this Bartell person says that because disease and immorality are running rampant and because there are wars and rumors of wars and because we've had a few more earthquakes that Jesus is coming again soon, right? We've heard all that before. No. Well, yes. Bartell goes into all those things, but his report goes much deeper than that. You see, to Bartell, the Bible's the greatest book ever written. Its message is so simple that it can be summed up in a few verses, yet at the same time, it's a book of so much depth that one could study a lifetime and never come close to fathoming all its truth. Bartell's theory about when the world might end started when he read a verse in Isaiah chapter 46. And the Bible says that God declares the end from the beginning. In Isaiah chapter 48, a similar passage shows up. To Bartell, this was an interesting thought that drove him back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 1 in the creation story. Bartell started to study that chapter, then he began to ask himself the question, why did God take six days to create the world and rest on the seventh? Probably to play golf with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> this may seem like a trite point to us, but it really bothered Bartell. I was always taught in Sunday school that it was to illustrate the work week, but Bartell didn't buy that. He felt there was more to it than that and spent a lot of time pondering this thought. Why would God take six days to create the world when he could have just created it in one second? in a blink of an eye. But he didn't. He took six days. Why? Bartell started to study the word day and days in the Bible and found some very interesting passages that related to this. He concluded that perhaps God was indicating to us how much time man would have on this earth. God must punish sin, you know, and he's going to avenge his word. Uh Uh-oh. Here we go. Typical Bible banger. Time to start using the scare tactics. Yeah, look out, everybody. The hell speech is coming. (laughs) Look, I told you, I didn't come down here to debate this. That's right, because there's nothing to debate here. This is stupid. Wait a minute. What basis did Bartell give that made him think this? Come Come on. Bartell makes the point that the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, is full of foreshadowing. An event actually happens in history that also pictures something coming in the future. An example of this would be when Abraham sacrificed his son Isaac. That event actually happened, but it was also a picture of what God would do with his son Jesus on the cross as an offering for the sins of the world. Now, why would God take six days to create the world? It's an interesting question. Is this a picture of something that we need to know? Bartell thinks it is. In 2 Peter 3.8, in the context is referring to the second coming of Christ, The Bible says that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. In Psalms 90, it says that a thousand years in God's sight are as but yesterday. So could this be that the six days of creation were to indicate to us the time that man would have on this earth would be about 6,000 years, with the seventh day of rest picturing the thousand year millennial reign when Christ comes back to set up his earthly kingdom, a time of righteousness and peace. Bartell documents in his report how Bible scholars have calculated from the first man, Adam, to the first coming of Jesus Christ to be about 4,000 years. If that's the case, then we could be living right at the end of what the New Testament calls the last days. Oh, I'm scared now. Uh, Turn or burn, right? (laughs) You sure this Bartell guy wasn't smoking something when he wrote this? Look, I just came down here to give you a message from Scott. I told you I should have never brought this up. Bartell's theory is unprovable. I'm sorry for your inconvenience. Have a good night. Wait, I thought you said Bartell had specific passages to back up his theory. Sorry, lady, the sermon's over. Hold on. I used to attend these philosophy club meetings when I was on this campus many years ago. We used to at least give a person a chance to make his case. These are still open meetings, right? What's wrong with you guys? It's a bunch of nonsense. Continue, young man. Express yourself. What else did Mr. Bartell say? I'm not trying to make a case here. Come on, I won't bite. He may, but I won't. (laughs) Bartell makes a big issue about how God deals with time in the Bible. And that when God measures time, he does so by sevens. God created the world in seven days with the seventh day being a day of rest. According to the Old Testament law, the Jews were commanded to rest every seven days. Plus, the seventh week after the Passover, they celebrated a big feast and a rest. The seventh month was perhaps their most important, where they celebrated three of their biggest feasts and a rest. Every seventh year was a year of rest for the land, and every 49 years, which is seven times seven, they celebrated the year of Jubilee, which is a year of rest for the land and liberty for the people. So it made sense to Bartell that God would set up this 7,000 year period for man to occupy this earth with the last thousand years being a time of rest when Jesus comes back to set up his earthly kingdom 
as spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. Or tell us right when he says that when God deals with time, he does so by sevens. There's no other more predominant system in the word of God. So God knows seven's a lucky number. Big deal. Look, the second coming of Christ is the most important day on God's calendar. Bartell is convinced that he wants us to know about it, including the timing. You still haven't given us any specific passages that you said Mr. Bartell referred to. Oh, yes, Matt. Please give us those passages before you leave, won't you? <laughs> what, passages that won't make sense to you? Verses you're just going to mock? No thanks. Come on, Matt. We need a good laugh. Let's hear these great passages. Preach it, brother. You want passages? Okay, I'll give you a couple passages. The first one's in Hosea. Hosea is an Old Testament prophet. You remember him, don't you, Greg? In chapter 6, he's talking about Israel, God's chosen nation who was always rejecting God. The nation was going to be torn apart, but verse 2 says, After two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. What is this? You see, when Jesus came, Israel rejected him as their Messiah, and so God scattered the nation all over the world. For 1,900 years, there is no nation of Israel. But God says that after two days or 2,000 years, I will revive thee and you, Israel, will live in my sight. We can see this happening already. The scattered nation of Israel has been regathered right in front of our eyes. In 1948, Israel became a nation again. This is very important because God is reviving this nation of Israel and they are about to live in his sight because Jesus is coming back to set up his earthly kingdom. Have you ever met a Canaanite, Frank? Or how about an Amorite? No because these were Israel's enemies and they have not been preserved. But the Jews have been because they're God's chosen people and he must fulfill the kingdom promises he made to them. But the Jews are still rejecting Christ. For how long? After two days or 2,000 years, I will revive thee and the third day you shall live in my sight. The second coming events could be about to begin. Bartel sees the same foreshadowing in Exodus chapter 19, verse 11, when God told Israel to get clean and wait for two days. Because in the third day, I'm coming down in the sight of all the nation. In John chapter 11, Lazarus, a Jew, has died, and Jesus waits two days before raising him from the dead. Why? Bartel says this pictures how God was about to turn his back on Israel for the next 2,000 years, or two days, and start reaching out to the rest of the world through the New Testament church, which he did. God doesn't just throw this stuff in here to waste space. Maybe Bartel's right. Maybe God's trying to tell us something. You're losing your audience, friend. Okay. I better give you another passage then. Bartel points out in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the mountain apart from the rest of the group. Now, what happens up there? Jesus is transfigured before these guys, and they're given a preview of his second coming glory. Now, I left out the first three words of that first verse in Scripture. It says, after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the mountain apart from the rest of the group. Why does God throw this in? Is he just wasting space again, or perhaps is God trying to tell us something that we need to know? Remember, the time from Adam to Christ is 4,000 years or four days. The time of the church period is 2,000 years or two days. So could this mean that sometime after six days or 6,000 years, God will revive Israel and fulfill the promises he made to them? Soon and very soon, there's going to be a time of judgment on this earth like never before, just prior to the return of Christ that the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. And guess what this is? A seven-year period. You confused? You want more? You know, I really think this Bartell guy is reading a bit between the lines, don't you think? Either that or maybe Bartell thinks that God's trying to tell us something. God judged the world once already in the days of Noah, remember? In Genesis chapter 6, he tells us there was a great population explosion and the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. Sounds like today, doesn't it? He wiped out the whole population with the flood and only eight people survived. God judged the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Because of the rampant sexual sin, homosexuality, and perversion there. Sounds like today, doesn't it? He wiped out those cities and only three people survived. And in both cases, the unbelievers were taken totally by surprise. But the believers weren't because they knew judgment was coming. All right, already enough of these Bible mathematics. I mean, what's the point? What's this Bartell guy trying to say? What Bartell is saying is that our time is about up. He doesn't think this current existence goes on forever. And sometime very soon, Israel will turn to Jesus as their Messiah, and Christ will come back to earth to begin his reign. What about you? And do you really believe this Bartell theory to be true? I told you. The theory is unprovable. I didn't even want to talk about it. Yeah, but you believe it? I mean, you really think this Bartell guy is right and that the world is going to end? I told you. I didn't want to discuss it. But do you think it's true? I want to know. 
Hey, I want to know. I don't know. Could be. But I do know this. The end of the world happens every day for some people because they die. And if a person doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, they will spend a conscious eternity in a lake of fire away from the presence of God. That much I'm sure of, which makes this a very serious issue. There are a lot of religions in the world. And what makes you think yours is the right one? No, oh, Derek, there are a lot of names for religion in the world. But they all fall into the same category. Every religion except biblical Christianity teaches that you can be saved by your own merit, you know, by being good or doing certain rituals. But the Bible says that no one can be right in God's eyes by doing good works, Romans 3.20, and that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. We must realize that the biblical standard to get into heaven is that you must be perfect, totally sinless or righteous, as the Bible calls it. Well, then if that's true, no one's getting into heaven because no one's perfect, not even you. That's right. That's why you and I both need Jesus Christ. We all do. You see, while Jesus was on this earth, he lived a totally perfect life. He never sinned because he was God. And then he died for us on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and rose from the dead and God allowed Christ back into heaven. Why? It wasn't because he was a good guy, but that he met the requirement of being perfect. You see, Jesus is righteous and only the righteous will inherit heaven. And if God didn't lower his standard for even his son, what makes you think he'll do so for us? Millions of people walk around and they think they're going to get into heaven by leading what they think is a good life, and they're in for a big shock because it's not enough. God has a standard of absolute perfection, and because only Jesus is perfect, it's only when we personally commit and receive him as our Lord and believe what he did for us on the cross that cleanses us from all our sins. That's why he deserves all the credit, and that's why you and I both need Jesus Christ. Sorry. I guess I'm just not as gullible as you are. Jesus Christ wants to give you eternal life, Derek plus real purpose for living today. I'll pass. It's your choice. Oh, Derek. Guys. Let me know if you come up with some better answers in regards to eternity, will ya? You know, something that offers some real hope. Or do you just try not to think about it? Of course, if you have the answers already, then we have nothing to worry about, do we? But if what the Bible says is true, then our eternal destiny is at stake and it's going to depend on what we do with Jesus Christ. If we reject him, then he'll reject us. But if we humbly receive him, then we will live with him in heaven for eternity. I hope you look into it. And you better hurry up because if what Bartel says is right, then our time is about up. situation. I wasn't looking for any trouble. Please, God, I just, I didn't want to argue or debate. I pray that you would somehow use this to your glory, God. Please, God. Matt! What? We need you, man. Come on, we need you. What? You got to him. There's several Christians in there. They're sharing their faith. There's conversations going on about Jesus. There's people that want to talk to us. Are you kidding? I'm serious. Come on, we gotta go. Come on, Matt, hurry up. Wait a minute. Go on. I'll, I'll see you there in a minute. Excuse me. Excuse me, ma'am. I was wondering if I could talk to you for a second. You came at me pretty hard in there, and I thought maybe we could talk privately for a minute. I thought you did an excellent job of presenting the information tonight. What? I said I thought you did an excellent job presenting the information tonight. Um... You are the same woman who was at the philosophy club meeting, right? That was me. I'm a little confused here. Maybe this will help. See, that paper that you so reluctantly defended in there tonight is very special to me. God used that paper to shine the light of eternity into a very darkened young girl's heart many years ago. I came to this campus in 1949, 
life in college were new and exciting and I was free from all the pressures my parents had tried to force on me about God. I'd heard the truth, but I wanted to live. I wanted to run my own life and found myself in a very dark and confused world. But God is so faithful. He not only used a shy college student's paper to illuminate my soul, but he led me to a faithful and godly husband. You mean you and... Yes, me and Jeffrey. After I met Jesus, the Lord graciously put a love in our hearts one for the other. Jeffrey was very concerned about what he wrote. How can anyone speak for God, he said. His hope was to get people thinking about eternity and that they would receive Christ before it was too late. You have to remember that Israel had just become a nation again the year before in 1948 and there was great anticipation in the air. The Lord really used what he said though. Students made hundreds of copies and a small revival started right on this campus. When I saw that poster yesterday, something inside just told me I had to go to that meeting. When I heard that you'd found Jeffrey's paper in the library, I knew what you'd read. I just had to see what would happen if his ideas could be gotten out. I'm not always so pushy. Are you and Jeffrey still together? Jeffrey went to be with the Lord five years ago. I'm sorry. Don't be. He led a joyous life full of service to the Lord. After we married, we moved away from here about 300 miles, lived in a small town enjoying our family, our church, and service to the Lord. But look, I don't want to keep you any longer. You need to get back inside. There are a lot of people that want to ask you questions about these things. It was a pleasure meeting you. Catherine. Catherine. The harvest is coming to an end, Matt. Do all you can to share the message of Christ. I understand. You really do need to get inside. Goodbye. But Catherine, one last thing. Did he really believe his theory? He believed in the possibility. I would have loved to have met him. He would really have enjoyed talking with you. I have a picture of Jeffrey if you'd like to see it. Sure. This was taken a couple of years before he died. We live on a small farm. It's a beautiful piece of land. I don't believe it. It's him. Who? The farmer in my dreams. This is the farmer in my dreams. So you're putting your faith in something you've never even seen. But it's not a blind faith. We can prove that God exists. Well, where? I don't see any proof. I mean, where is he? God's a spirit. You can't see. Oh, he's probably just hiding. I mean, come on, God. Come out and show yourself like a man. <laughs> Those guys don't want to hear about the paper. Why not? It's too controversial for one thing. Oh, this is good. This is good stuff. We got to use this. Yeah, I think church boy's going to wish he never stepped into this office. <laughs> the hypocrite. The harvest is coming to an end, Matt. Do all you can to share the message of Christ. You see, to Bartel, the Bible is the greatest book ever written. Its message is so simple that it can be summed up in a few verses, yet at the same time, it's a book of so much depth that one could study a lifetime and never come close to fathoming all its truth. There's several Christians in there. They're sharing their faith. There's conversations going on about Jesus. There's people that want to talk to us. What's wrong with you guys? It's a bunch of nonsense. 
Why would God take six days to create the world when he could have just created it in one second, in a blink of an eye? But he didn't. He took six days. Why? Oh, I'm scared now. Uh, turn or burn, right? I don't care. You gotta get over there. I can't! I gotta get myself right with the Lord. The harvest is coming to an end, Matt. Do all you can to share the message of Christ. Jesus Christ wants to give you eternal life, Derek, plus real purpose for living today. I'll pass. It's your choice. <laughs>